welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Super Game Brothers podcast. This is episode number 32 of our weekly board game and video game podcast that we do every single week as two brothers. My name is David, and I'm joined, as always, by my brother Devin, two weeks in a row in person, sitting right next to me. No, oh, yeah. no more virtual podcasts, actually. It might happen often. I'm not 100% sure yet, but it's been kind of fun. It is, yeah. I think virtual sometimes seems a little bit easier. Yeah, we're more in a flow with that, for sure. But this is wonderful. Now we can have guests. Yeah. Yeah, who's going to sit on your lap next week? Probably Santa. <laughs> yeah, that's that's that sounds, you know, festive, seasonal. I like it. Yeah. Yeah, I think the audio is going to sound a little better this week. The mic filters are working. It, it was being funky last week, so... Uh... It's a work in progress. We're slowly making progress. The studio's getting a little better every week. Uh, but yeah, it's fun. Devin, just kind of putting a wrap on the month of October. I think this is all the Halloween candy left at my house, which uh, is quite a bit of candy in there, actually. But I think my oldest son got four and a half pounds, and my second son, they're seven and five, got 4.3 pounds. So they, I was like nine pounds of candy where'd that go that's a good question it's only october what's today seventh sixth it's november but yeah oh yeah november (laughs) today it'll say on my ipad it's the sixth of november (laughs) so you know you can't leave a can a bunch of candy at my house for a week it's gonna be gone you already know what's going to happen but since it's here i might eat a couple pieces during the episode so if you hear me slurping on a starburst you know that that's what that is but um, I guess also putting a wrap on Halloween, Devin. I finally got my wife to watch one scary movie, and it was quite an ordeal because it was after trick or treating, and she was like, "We should watch a scary movie." And I was, I like jumped up and down at the opportunity. I was like, "Yes, I've been wanting to for like a year. Maybe this is a Halloween tradition now, and it might be the only night a year she lets me." So I spent like twenty minutes deciding which mov- movies we were going to watch, and it came down to. Oddity or long long legs, and uh, long legs seemed a little bit more her style as like a crime thriller with a serial killer. So that's the movie we chose, um, and I like I liked it quite a bit. The parts I liked about it were the acting I thought was really good, and the cinematography was very weird, kind oh, yeah. of unique. Mm-hmm. So I liked that a lot. Um, I. Yeah, I thought it was really I thought it was good. I won't I don't think it was great or excellent. I think the thing that kind of pulled me out of it was it kind of leans into the supernatural religious kind of demonic element and I wanted it to be a little more grounded. One of my favorite movies is Prisoners, which is also about like a kidnapping and a serial killer. I like crime thrillers quite a bit. Um and so I was hoping it was going to be a little more that fashion. And it seemed like it was for like the first three quarters of the movie, mm. even though she did, she was seeing that like devil goat pretty constantly through Goodness, the movie. My memory sucks. <laughs> and I, I was love like, horror films, but I don't remember it. And I was like, is, is this in her head? And this is going to be a grounded movie or is she actually seeing the devil? And I think she was. <laughs> and uh. they ended up being these weird little demon balls that the guy put in some cursed dolls. It was all kinds of weird. I'm going to have to rewatch it. <laughs> Pretty good movie, though. If you like like one that kind of is has a creepy vibe the whole time, definitely. And it's a little violent at a couple parts that catch you off guard. But nothing was like crazy over the top, for sure. So, yeah, enjoyed that one as my close to Halloween. That's a, a kind of endorsement for Long Legs. I think it has like a can't remember if it's a 6.9 or a 7.1 on IMDb. And I think that's about right. That's about what I would... Pretty decent for that genre. Yeah, no, totally. For the genre, it's really good, but... Yeah. Anything above a 6 on IMDb in horror is usually worth a watch. I watched one last night called Starry Eyes. Hmm. And I think it was from 2016, maybe? And it kind of, like, shows their idea of the struggle of going through Hollywood and becoming an actress. And Oh. The sacrifices she had to make were 
I don't think realistic. Really? But it got weird. Yeah, it kind of just like turned into a slasher in a way. It was nutty. Wow. But dude, I went through Netflix, Hulu, Prime, Max, Peacock, Paramount, Shutter. That's probably about it. That's a lot. But I, I swear, all the highlighted featured movies, I've seen every single one of them. I was like, there's nothing else to watch for me. Just in horror? Or out of <laughs> all movies, period. Oh, just in horror. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, you have seen way more of them than me. I'm sad there's not more, but maybe it's a good time to be November. Have you seen uh, Smile 2 yet? No, I would like to. That one's reviewed very well. Yeah, I liked the first. The first is super weird. I won't spoil it, but very weird. It, it kind of freaked me out when I was watching it. I went to the theater by myself and watched that. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and yeah, I couldn't do that. That was odd. So I hope that I hope the new one's good. Yeah, I want to see Heretic though. Yeah, that one looks really cool too. It's way sweet. And uh the actress in Smile 2 is the same actress that plays uh, Jasmine yes. in the Aladdin uh -huh. movie, which when I found that out, I was like, oh, wow, I didn't realize that because she looks way different. Yeah. She's super cute. <laughs> She's a good actress. I like her. And from a few of... <coughs> I'm going <black> crazy. <laughs> I'm coughing on something. Anyways, continue. It's the candy. <laughs> it is. There's some, someone put something in my candy. Yeah. A razor blade. Yeah, <laughs> there's a razor blade in my throat. A few of the reviews I read on uh, Smile 2 said that her performance is like ultra good. So I kind of want to see that one. That's a that movie is a bit of a step up from Long Legs <laughs> as far as like uh, scares. Go. Oh, for sure. Yeah. 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 But, I wasn't scared of Long Legs. I don't yeah, remember it. But I wasn't like very scared either. There were some creepy, intense parts, but. Yeah, so I don't know if I'll be able to get my wife into that one. Um, but yeah, Heretic, or Heretic, Heretic, I think, um, is supposed to be really good. I'm excited to see that one as well. Cool. Um, other than that, I don't think uh, too much new has happened at our place. We did the trick-or-treating thing. Kids really liked it. We ran around for a long time. Got tons of candy, like I mentioned. Did you go? Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Our kids are still really young. We have seven, five, and two-year-olds, so it was uh, lots of walking slow with kids, but they were pumped, so that was fun to see. Um, yeah, I don't think anything else new for me in the last seven days other than that, though. I got a few board game deliveries. Arcs is going to be here tomorrow, baby. Um, whoa, whoa. And Daitoshi. And... Pagan Fate of Ren Oak is going to be here next week, too. Daitoshi. That's that game I was talking about on that podcast, because you haven't seen Ready Player One, but you have right. Daito and Shell. Right. Yeah, you did. Daito mention. Shell. Yeah. They right. dropped the ball. They did. Yeah. It's crazy. Um, I really think you're going to like the Pagan one, though. You play as either a witch hunter or a coven of witches. And the witch hunter is trying to deduce which of the witches is the act or the suspects or the actual witch and the other person is trying to keep it secret so there's like a lot of witch hiding. you like witch stuff there's a lot of witches in there a lot of witches <laughs> that's for dang sure did How i say witch could a witch 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 did i say witch a bunch of times witches <laughs> i probably did uh anyways but yeah other than uh some board game deliveries we're going to talk about a game that we just played actually it's here on my table right in front of us spoilers we'll keep that well i guess not no spoilers we'll keep that a secret for until the end of the episode but mm -hmm. um yeah so it's been a fun fun week played a lot of games played some video games which is has been a little rare for me lately but i uh plugged away a couple indie games so fun stuff to uh to talk about there's only a couple news items so this won't be a very long episode but i guess with that we'll just jump right in Devin. i, I have guess. one Oh yeah, I love thing it. of news. Well, I want the tangent. I want to hear it. I or I did an Amazon order. Okay, I got some body wash because I get little bumps on my arms. Ah, trying to get rid of those. Got the salicylic acid blend. Oh yeah, 
Nice. And then I ordered a uh, an adapter for that other neon light so it can dim. Oh, nice. That'll be cool. And then got some magnesium. You guys should all take magnesium. It'll change your life. What kind? Aren't there like three kinds? I take three and eight. L3 three. and eight. But a lot of okay. people take glycinate. Okay. Uh, and then the weirdest thing I ordered was another supplement called Shilajit. Have I talked to you about this? Is that a uh, slur you just said? It is. <laughs> Shilajit? Shilajit. S-H-I-L-A-J-I-T. Okay. And in its purest form, I don't know. It's like high. you get it from a high altitude, like grows on rocks, and it grows in this black resin. Resin? Or something. And I'm talking thick tar goop. Really? It comes with a mini shovel. And you get a pea-sized amount, and you put it in, like, warm water or milk. I did milk. Mm, that sounds about right. And it was weird, but it smells. I should have brought it. I, I was halfway here, and I was like, dang it. I should have brought the shilajit. I should have brought the <laughs> shilajit. But it comes in this tiny little container, and you scoop it out, and it's so goopy and tough. And it smells like asphalt or shoe polish. Sounds like something I want in my body. Yeah. <laughs> and it tastes like that as well. Wow. So, what are trying the, that out. What are the benefits supposed to be allowing? Um, lowering cortisol, which is your stress hormone, I right. think. Right, yeah. Um, says that there's a good chance of that. Overall well-being, energy, stamina stuff, um, mood. And then one guy that was taking it, I mean, you don't know what you can trust online, but he said that it was like cleansing him. Like he was like, eventually weird stuff was like coming out of his sinuses and he felt like he was like coughing up unhealthy things. And I was like, I'm in. All that mold in his body was just coming out. Yeah. It's supposed to be super good. It has like all the trace minerals you need or so. I don't know. Trace minerals. I don't know. Oh. I just try things. All I right. get I get really hyped on the supplements. Yeah. And I need to do it. So I'll yeah. let you know if I'm not here in a month. It was the Shilajit. It was the Shilajit. It took a big, <laughs> yep. <laughs> big dose of that Shilajit. Yep. Yeah. Devin, um, whenever we play like a video game, he is Mr. Settings. He like likes to get the dead zone on the analog sticks like perfect. And that kind of bleeds over to his... Uh, Supplements a bit too with the Shilajit and the magnesium three and eight. I'm all about perfect settings. Yeah. Soft button pusher. Yep. Every button in my car is very easily touched. Nothing breaks. Mm -hmm. And then yeah, with supplements and health, I test out all the settings. And some of them are useless, but there's a few. Creatine, magnesium, vitamin D3 that will stay in the arsenal. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's all for me. I don't know if I've done anything else. So did that when you blend the shilajit in uh -huh. the milk, uh -huh. did the milk turn black? Did the shilajit dissolve or was it still goopy? Well, in water, it dissolves and it turns the water into like oil looking kind of. But okay. then in the milk, it kind of went like fine mist. I could kind of see some black. Mm. So I was like shaking it and I took one of those frothers, mm -hmm. started blending that up. Yep. And then the milk was way hot and frothy and it was, tasted like shoe polish warm shoe polish luckily it was a pretty subtle taste but man that stuff's nasty they say if you don't take it that way though it won't absorb so because they have it in like pill form or like honey sticks oh but i guess this is i'm supposed to drink it this is the bioavailable form mm. i don't know yeah so we'll see if i'm just uh super super happy in a couple months mm. i don't know yeah if you are, we've got the high altitude mineral rocks in Zimbabwe to thank. Uh, Himal Himalaya. The Him Himalaya. Himalayan. They got it, it off of uh, Mount Everest. The Himalayan. Exactly. Is, where, where's Mount Everest? Is that in the Himalayan mountains? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, don't know. <laughs> I don't know geography. I don't either. I, is it in America? <sighs> Probably. Seems like most things are. Yeah. Speaking of uh, America, we just had the uh, general election yesterday, so everyone be nice to everybody, you know, no matter what your uh, political leaning is. All are welcome here on Super Game Brothers. Just make sure you're all nice to each other out there. 
craziness everywhere. So be the be the nice change if you want to see in the world. Um, cool. Well, I don't think I'll be trying the Shilla Jet anytime soon, but you know who knows? Maybe maybe I'll be converted. Christmas is coming. Oh, I yeah. already know what everyone's stocking stuff. Yeah, so. just a plastic baggie like a sandwich bag full of Shilla Jet. Mm-hmm. Coal and Shilla Jet. Yeah. Yep. You're gonna love it. <laughs> I I imagine I will. Cool, Devin. Well, that is a uh, that's quite a. And you ordered that on Amazon. Got there in five hours. Wow, really? Yeah, it was like noon, and it showed up at like five thirty. I was like, oh yeah. <laughs> it sounds like there was a guy, like in the ditch behind mom and dad's house just dumping mud in a bucket mm-hmm. and he put a post up it's like hey you want the shilajit we'll be there in five hours well, there's a phone <laughs> number on the bottle too oh nice he, yeah he likes me yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh that's funny well i'll look into the shilajit or ask my wife she's into that kind of supplement stuff too so she's probably heard of it well this is a uh, not the shilajit podcast even though that would probably be a very entertaining podcast but this is a board game and video game podcast we talk about the games we've been playing in the last week some news in the industries talk about board games and crowdfunding at the moment and it's generally a fun time please uh like the episodes leave us positive reviews on itunes subscribe to the show on spotify and itunes and you can also check out our patreon and follow it completely for free on patreon.com slash supergamebrothers but if you do throw us a couple dollars over there then you can get the episodes early right into the show we'll go over your questions live on the show all kinds of fun stuff over there so uh, make sure to check that out as well all right devin news mini nuke this uh this week is just some smaller items here we've got some board game announcements i'm going to switch over to the uh screen here in just a second um but yeah just a few board game announcements and a couple video game items so swapping over here let's see if i can throw this link up it's not as easy with the visuals as it was virtually it it, virtually it's nice because devin's four thousand dollar computer will just uh pull up everything immediately but my computer will explode so i have to throw the tabs from my ipad but um, a few games announced to be coming next year. This first one is called Wizards Cup, and it's being published by Pandasaurus Games in February of 2025 and designed by, I don't know how to pronounce that, but Saiji Kanai, I believe. And I'll read the description here and pull up this image, maybe scroll through a couple. What do we got going here? It looks like it's a deck of cards, kind of. Uh, Tonight starts the Wizard's Cup, a magical dueling tournament held once every century. As the king of a country, you will select the six best wizards from your kingdom and decide the order in which they will compete. Yes, your role ends there, and and all that remains is to watch your trusted wizards battle it out. In Wizard's Cup, you want to build the best team you can, anticipating how your opponent might attack. Each player starts with a set of 18 cards, and your opponent draws a card at random. From your deck that must be one of the wizards on your team you then choose five more wizards arrange five of the six wizards into a deck then place the sixth aside in a waiting zone each player reveals their top wizard and places it in the dual zone then you see who wins resolve wizard powers first then if needed compare the elements on these cards for example light beats shadow nature beats water if they share the same element Then they draw the next wizard from their deck to go against the opposing victorious wizard. Keep resolving duels until a player has no cards remaining. The other player claims a victory token. Each player can then swap one wizard from their six with an unused card, after which they again create a five-card deck and duel. Whoever collects two victory tokens first wins. Kind of an odd rock-paper-scissors kind of mechanism, it seems like, with the different suits beating each other. I don't know, could be a fun, light, what seems like a two-player card game. Kind of reminds me of Jaipur with the best-of-three mechanism where you have to get two of the victory 
tokens. Next up is one that's probably going to be a bit more popular, I would imagine. This one is a two-player variant of a very popular game called the Isle of Cats. I have the Isle of Cats on the shelf behind Devin. You probably can't see it just off camera, but this is Isle of Cats Duel, and it actually comes out <clears throat> next month, December Ooh. of 2024. My synopsis is much shorter. You are citizens of Squall's End on a rescue mission to the Isle of Cats and must save as many cats as possible before the evil Lord Vesh arrives. Each cat is represented by a unique tile and belongs to a family. You must find a way to make them all fit on your boat while keeping families together. The Isle of Cats duel replaces the card drafting from the original Isle of Cats game with a new movement system guided by an Oshax cat. Players take turns moving around the island, where your move determines which cats, treasures, and lessons you can access and will shape the options available to your opponent on their next turn. In the end, the player who best balances rescuing, completing lessons, and limiting their opponent's options will prove themselves as the ultimate cat rescuer. Cool. I like the Isle of Cats. It's fun. It's not my favorite polyomino game or my favorite card drafting game. But it mixes those things together pretty well. Um, and it seems like here, instead of passing your cards around, you're moving that white cat in the middle. Let's see if I can zoom in on it. Yeah, right there a little bit. To different spots in order to choose what you're taking. If it's one of the objective cards or a new cat for your boat. And much like the first one, you have to cover up as much as you can. Because any rats that are showing, I'm assuming, are negative one point. Just like they are in... The base game so that one is coming I've played out the base game have you now that i'm seeing this yes yeah i think it's been a minute since i've played it so it's probably a been a minute since you've played it too but yeah that was one of the earlier games i got getting into hobby board games and i it's been one i've thinking i've been thinking about purging for a while but i do like it it's a fun game just uh have some others i probably like a little bit more than it. okay next up is one called Freaks with a Z exclamation mark Mutant Murder Machines. And it's being published by Osprey Games and designed by, oh, I lost the name. Oh, Michael Whelan on the box that says Michael Wheels Whelan. He's fast. He, he's fast? Or he's got one of those devices, much like Axel in Twisted Metal uh -huh. with his arms and the big tires. That's why they call him Wheels. Amazing. Uh, that's probably not true. but and I think that's the only image. So I was going to scroll and see if there are any game components. But anyways, there is the image. And um, this one also comes out this month on November 12th. I'll take this one away too. Oh, yeah. Go for it. Freaks is a rules light skirmish war game set in a bombastic post-apocalyptic world of mutants and cartoon violence. The game pits savage mutant gangs against one another as they pillage the ruins of a devastated world in pursuit of hollowed artifacts. These objects of great atomic power were forged in the flames of nuclear destruction and can bestow mighty mutations on their bearers in an instant. Wow. Gain leathery wings and fly above the battlefield, grow giant plates of bone armor, or develop, develop chameleon-like skin and fade from sight. But beware the consequences of this power. Collect too many artifacts or rip too many from the bodies of your fallen foes, and you may lose control. A mortal can bear only so many mutations before they are twisted beyond humanity, becoming one of the monstrous creatures that stalk the waste. Freaks features streamlined gameplay to get you playing quickly. Generate an entire squad in seconds by drawing from a standard deck of playing cards. Move your fighters without measuring. Resolve attacks in a single matched dice roll. Lead your fledgling group of nobodies through a campaign as they evolve into mutant killers and pledge their allegiance to the atomic gods. Wow. Gods with a Z. Hey, Z. <laughs> well, that's Freaks. I'm not a huge skirmish uh, game, but I do like combat in some games, so I don't know. I, I like the silly art style, so that might be an okay one. But if, if you like uh, skirmish games, then maybe that one uh, would be for you as well. Okay, next up is an, a new game from, nope, I skipped one, is mm. a new game that is going to be releasing next year at Spiel, so not for quite a while. Um, 
but it's being published by a publisher that's had quite a bit of success this year. I think they published Galileo Galilee, which just came out, and I think one other game. And this one is called Forestry, and it's a, what seems to be a pretty medium, maybe medium heavy Euro game about kind of uh, about forestry, about conservation of the forest. Anyway, so I'm going to read this description here and it reads i guess i should say published by pink trabadour and designed by Mikhail piacol sorry if i pronounced that incorrectly in forestry players take on the role of forest stewards dedicated to sustainable forest management the game challenges players uh, to balance the demands of harvesting resources I'm trying to click on pictures here at the same time, which isn't good. It looks like that might be the only image. So anyways, there's the cover. Uh, with harvesting resources and fulfilling contracts with the need for environmental conservation, every action taken has a lasting impact on the forest's health, and players are encouraged to make responsible choices from planting new trees to adjusting water streams for optimal moisture retention. Drawing from the expertise of real life foresters forestry provides a realistic and educational glimpse into the work of forestry making it as engaging as it is enlightening as a euro game focused on strategic action management forestry forestry relies on a dual worker system in which players control a harvester and a manager each with distinct responsibilities the harvester moves through the forest felling trees to meet contract demands replanting saplings constructing infrastructure and adjusting water retention to promote a healthy healthy ecosystem meanwhile the manager oversees resource collection utilizes sawmill buildings fulfills contracts and optimizes wood processing players must carefully allocate action points between these workers to make sustainable choices enhance infrastructure and ensure the forest thrives while meeting demand i like uh worker placement games that have a uh, varied workers i think that's a fun mechanism it didn't say here that it is worker placement but you use action points on the different workers so i don't know that could be a cool one seems like it's uh getting some early buzz for you know release a year from now so if you're uh wanting to be hyped about a game you can't play for a year there you go that's uh forestry from pink trabadour i'll be thinking about that game yeah well until you until it comes out probably Devin's going to learn all about forestry. He's going to start planting trees in his backyard. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, all yeah. kinds I'll of stuff. order seeds tomorrow. Yeah. All right. Next up is one <laughs> called Coming of Age. This one is from Ludo Nova and Danny Garcia, who is one of my favorite recent designers recently. Um, some of the games that he's designed is Daitoshi, which we talked about. It's mm. coming next week. Um, Arborea I have behind me that he did i really liked i think he did one called barcelona that i don't have i feel like i have one more from him Ugh, memory is leaving me but arborea is really cool um so very excited whenever he announces a game this one's called coming of age in coming of age you will start the game as a child and as such you will have a limited set of interests and skills that will determine your development during this time, your parents' help will be important for your progress. As the years go by, you will grow and acquire new interests, gain more independence, and with it, access to other experiences that will allow you to achieve your own life goals. In this journey through adolescence, you will form memories, shape different traits of your personality, make friends, fall in love, and try to manage frustrations with the goal of realizing yourself as a person by fulfilling your dreams and ambitions. Using a dice management mechanism, you will visit different locations in the city, acquiring experiences that will modulate various aspects of your personality reflected on your personal board with the goal of achieving the different life goals you will acquire during the game. I think that one sounds really cool. I think this theme is not one used in board games very much. It's usually like, who can get the most dragon points, you know? Mm. Yeah, Instead yeah. of like, who can get the most awesome personality? and have experiences growing up as a teenager, which sounds cool. Maybe the game will be terrible, but I really like the artwork as well. So yeah, anyway, it's cool. Kind of seems unique. Again, there's only kind of a cover image at this point, but 
like I already mentioned, Danny Garcia game means David's in. I want to try it. So that one is coming of age, Ludo Nova from next year. So that's all the board game stuff. There's not a lot of video game announcements this week, Devin, but I thought this one was pretty cool. This device is Ooh. called the uh, Hori Pad, and it's made specifically for uh, use with Steam and Win I think Windows 10 and 11. And so it actually has like a Steam button there in the middle that'll pull up like your Steam hot commands or whatever they're called. Um, I think the controller looks really slick. The couple other cool things about it. Let's see if I can pull up the feature page. So it comes out on December 16th for $60, which is a pretty competitive price for a controller nowadays. It doesn't have rumble, which most third-party controllers don't. Um, but some of the cool things it does have are listed... Where are they listed? Here. This is really interesting. Capacitive touch thumbsticks. Um, so you can uh, have different like functions available when your thumbs are like touching the thumbstick. Reminds me of the steering wheel in our new minivan that we have, where if you like take your hands off it when it's doing its own cruise control, it like beeps at you and says, please put your hands back on the steering wheel. So this like knows if you're touching the thumbstick. And if you are or not, it looks like you can have different functions trigger. The uh, example they give here is customize the capacitive touch thumbsticks to toggle the gyro function or other functions. So if my thumb is not on the stick, then I could use gyro maybe. Ah, I see. Um, kind of it. Never seen that before. I wonder uh, how they'll sell this because there's such easy plugins to hooking a dual sensor and Xbox controller to your PC. Yeah, I imagine that having like a dedicated Steam button that pulls stuff up and that capacitive touch thing is how they're trying to stand up out. And a quick access button. Menu for simple settings. I think the price probably is also probably helping them a bit because even a dual sense is like twenty dollars more than this and it has it does have back paddles as well oh wow um i couldn't remember if it has and it has gyro i don't know if it has hall effect uh analog sticks though if it does that would be like amazing and i would want one those are the uh analog sticks that can't get drift because they use magnets instead of an actual physical component um, it runs on Bluetooth or through a wired cable. I think it has, uh, yeah, you can switch between analog or digital trigger buttons. And it, I don't think it mentions Hall Effect Stick, so it probably doesn't. At that price point, it, you know, yes, seems unlikely that it would. But I think like the, uh, what are they called? The 8-Bit Do Pro controller has Hall Effect Sticks, I think. But yeah, I don't see that listed here, and I think they would use that as a selling point. But anyways, I thought it looked pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. it's sweet looking. I, I like to hold controllers to see how they yeah. feel. The like lines look so straight almost that I'm like, <clears> is <throat> it going to be like ergonomic? It feels like, I don't know, maybe flipping here to the back. Yeah. Though, it it kind of looks nice. What's that wired? Oh, and that's the trigger type. There's a little toggle on the back. And... I think it comes with a Bluetooth adapter if your PC doesn't have like Bluetooth built in, which is cool. So December 16th for uh, that guy, if you really like gaming on PC and have wanted like a cool new controller. All right. Next up here in the news mini nuke, we just got through kind of the game announcements. This one is uh, new games to subscription services. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this first update here is for Xbox Game Pass. And this is the first wave for November 2024. And some good looking games here, in my opinion. Kind of wish I had Game Pass, especially for this first one. Um, so let's just scroll th here through some of those games. First one is a brand new game. This one, is, I think, is a day one launch. Yeah, it says right there, available on day one. Metal Slug Tactics, which is a tactical strategy game. And the review I read from Push Square, who I really like that website, they said that it's some of the best tactical gameplay since Into the Breach. And Into the Breach is an awesome, awesome game. So I'm excited to try this one. If you have Game Pass, make sure to try it. It's included. 
as long as you like tactical games that has cool pixel art using the metal slug characters I'm very excited to try that one uh next up on november 6th which is uh today i think we discovered right yeah is a uh, go mecha ball um, and i'll just open that while we're uh, here that one is out on november 6th it's a twin stick shooter with roguelike progression i don't know much else about it a couple of other smaller ones here on the sixth harold halibut it's a handmade narrative game about friendship <laughs> Friendship and, then, and fish. Yeah. The Rewinder is a 2D puzzle adventure game. You got me. Inspired by traditional Chinese folklore. You still got me. I'd play that. 2D puzzle game. Love it. A uh, Turnip Boy Robs a Bank. I've actually heard that these Turnip Boy games are kind of funny. Like Turnip Boy Commits Tax Evasion, I think is the first one. Um, so that one's also on the 6th. Then on the 7th, you got Goat Simulator Remastered. This is also available on day one game is kind of famous for just being ridiculous and you can run around as this goat with its tongue hanging out and doing weird things um then i think the next big one is microsoft flight simulator 2024 on the 19th and that's also available on day one flight simulator is one of microsoft's like most critically loved series i think you can fly from like thousands of real airports and like the cockpits and everything are like actually made to feel like true to the aircrafts and you can play in like ultra hard mode where you actually have to like press all the buttons correctly and stuff or you can just mm. fly up and i think it uses google maps data to like uh populate areas too so you can like fly over your hometown and it looks like it weird stuff crazy um so that one's on the 19th and i think that's the end of this update here <clears throat> they do mention starcraft remastered came to pc on the 5th same with starcraft 2 and a couple dlc packs for call of duty black ops 6 which was also on game pass uh, last month so and a few things leaving all right so that is a uh, xbox game pass next up there is one game on the epic game store and there's also an apex legends pack if you play that a lot this one's called deceive incorporated and it's been out for about a year and it says go undercover as the world's greatest spies in this multiplayer game of subterfuge disguise as anyone deploy high-tech gadgets or neutralize the competition as long as you extract with the objective no trick is too dirty when you work for deceive inc um i'd actually never heard of this one but i ch checked it out on open critic it's in like the mid 70s so pretty respectable score for like a not very well-known multiplayer game so make sure you add that to your uh Epic Game Store Library, especially if you like playing games with friends. All right. Next up, a big update for Amazon Prime. If you have Prime, <laughs> are you going to let me watch? Yeah, get, get that X out of here. Um, there's a bunch of free games in November. Some of them I think they've maybe given out before, but uh, man, quite a few. So let's just, here's kind of an image of some of them. Um, some big ones. So first up on the first, so it's already available, is Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy, which is an awesome, awesome Guardians of the Galaxy game. Mafia Definitive Edition, also on the first. Then tomorrow, from when we're recording, is uh, Dishonored Definitive Edition, also an excellent, excellent game. Duck Paradox, I don't know what that one is. Navigate the infinite domains of the multiverse as savvy scientist Dr. Paradox. In search of her pet duck. <laughs> uh, I love loved what I just read. So that's also on the seventh. Then close to the sun, on the seventh, and Disney Pixar Cars, which I've played Disney's Pixar's Cars two and three, which are actually pretty fun. Um, I don't know what the first one's like though. Bang Bang Racing is a pretty fun top-down racing game. Snake Bird Complete. I don't know what that one is. Embark on an extraordinary puzzle-solving adventure. Don, I'm in. Love puzzles. And then on the 14th, Mrs. Holmes, The Case of the Dancing Men, Collector's Edition. <laughs> I thought it was of the Dancing Men Collectors. Maybe it is. <laughs> it's that edition. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. Uh, Chasm the Rift. Having its roots in 1997 and developed in Ukraine, Chasm the Rift is one of the most thrilling and innovative first-person shooters from this era. House of Golf 2, 
also on the 14th. And Tomb Raider Anniversary, also on the 14th. And Blade of Darkness. Then on the 21st, you got Max, The Curse of Brotherhood, Overcooked Gourmet Edition, great game. Gloomy Tales, One-Way Ticket Collector's Edition. They got a lot of these collector's editions going on. Super Meat Boy, awesome indie game. Moon Scars, Under Grim Moonlight, Fierce Claiborne Warrior, Gray, Warrior Gray Irma, Battles Driven by a Lonely Purpose, Find the Sculptor, and Unravel the Mystery of Her Existence. I don't know what that said. Riot, Civil Unrest, Elite Dangerous, a big, big game about space. To keep our show family friendly, we got Sir, Sir Whoopus. <laughs> Sir Whoopus, Immortal Death. Warning, this game contains puns, dad jokes, Flappy Bird-like arcade minigames, breaking of the fourth wall, and jabs directed at try-hard, overly serious RPGs. There you go. Jurassic World Evolution. I played the second one of that for a minute. It was kind of fun. It's basically a roller coaster tycoon, but without roller coasters, you're building a dinosaur park. What was that called? They had one called Dinosaur Tycoon, I thought. It doesn't matter. Uh, and then on the 27th is the Jurassic World one and Mystery Case Files, the Dalimar Legacy Collector's Edition and Shogun Show Showdown. So some bangers and some games I've never heard of before. But if you have Amazon Prime, make sure you uh, add these to your Prime library. It's just free games included with your subscription. All right, Devin, I think that is all of the games to subscription services. Any of those that we just went over that seem... Uh, hot like hot news to to Devin. guardians of the galaxy was fun yeah um, i like that one i recommend playing it it's good enough mm -hmm. uh, and then goodness just like the two that are big here i guess jurassic world that seems funny to me yeah just because it's, it's dinosaurs mm -hmm. but yeah I, don't I would check out overcooked as well if you like co-op games and if you have game pass i would uh try out metal slug tactics i would also play dishonored yeah excellent game yeah. Yeah, there's some good ones in there. If your kids like cars, it's you know, supposed to be pretty fun. All right, Devin, for video games this week, I've been playing two. Um, and pretty uh in depth. I got really into Vampire Survivors. I think I've almost beaten every level with one of the characters. There's like 50 characters in the game. And I like Imelda. She's not the one you start with. That's basically Simon Belmont with a Castlevania whip. She's the next one that uses, like, the ice wand. Um, but this game is just so fun. My kids are, like, all into it, too. And even Lacey played it for a minute, and she's like, this is way fun. How, why is it so fun? Really? Um, it's just, like, combo-tastic. And you slowly get, like, more and more powerful, and then more and more energy, energy enemies just fill the screen. And it keeps, like, a death count of how many enemies you've killed on each level. And it'll be like in the thirty thousands. <laughs> it's and it, what? Uh, oh, it's saying right here: Switch, Xbox, Steam. It's, on, it's not on PlayStation. It is now. Yeah. Oh. It just came to PlayStation, I think, in the last few weeks. And just, is it a relatively cheap game? Uh, five dollars. Oh. Yeah. Well, and it's worth it. Oh, absolutely! It's like the best five dollars I've I'm ever. I'm always spent. looking for co-op or local co-op. Yeah, and that's a new feature: the local co-op thing. It's fun. Um, I actually haven't tried the local co-op yet, but. I'm afraid if I tell my kids it has it, then they won't just watch me. They'll want to play the whole time. Ah, and mm -hmm. <laughs> so that that's one of the lies you tell. As Strategic a secrets. Strategic lying. But man, Vampire Survivors is super, super awesome. There's tons of different stages and you can play them on like hyper mode, which is like double speed. And you can adjust the difficulty, like ramp it up like crazy. And it has like secret levels and all kinds of crazy stuff. I feel like I've almost beat every level with Imelda, but I imagine there's quite a few more secrets that I haven't discovered yet. So if you haven't played that, man, play it. It might be on Game Pass. I think it was at one point. Um, but yeah, $5 for the base game on PlayStation Network is where I'm playing it. And then it has a bunch of DLC packs. It just got a Castlevania DLC pack and a Contra DLC pack with like guns and stuff. It's just, <laughs> it's so fun. Just play Vampire Survivors. It's great. <laughs> the other one um, I've been playing, Devin actually started on stream um, a few weeks ago, I think. This is an indie horror game, kind of in the vibe of Resident Evil 1, Resident Evil 2. It's called Crow Country. 
And I've just about beat this one. I'm almost done, I think. I've probably played 10 hours, which is kind of crazy for me to play 10 hours of a video game in a single week. You got much further than I did then. Yeah. Like, I've seen this part, seen this part. I've seen all these parts. So I'm pretty sure I'm almost to the end. I have the map almost fully uncovered. It has this cool... There is a map. We talked about this last week, how it was a little hard to tell where you were because of the doors between rooms. Does it just give it to you kind of late? You have to find them for each area. So oh, okay. they'll be like hidden on a wall or something. It's our Resident Evil. The new Resident Evil. Or not yeah. Resident Evil. Silent Hill is. Yeah. But man, it's super fun. I really like it. The, um, it just gives me Resident Evil vibes with a slightly more cartoony look so it doesn't seem like as... I don't know. Creepy. It's also fun that it's in a, an amusement park. It's like, you know, Disneyland. If Disneyland was based on crows. And then the park attraction started like trying to hurt you <laughs> but it's a really fun it has overwhelmingly positive reviews here on uh, steam and i think it reviewed really well on other platforms as well it's fun if you like retro games and puzzles um i think you'll really really enjoy it I, it's surprisingly longer than i thought it was going to be it's quite a bit longer than like the fear of the spotlight game that you played as well um like i said i bet i've played eight to ten hours at this point and if you find some extra secrets, you'll get like this thing on the map that will tell you where secrets are that you haven't found yet. And I'm trying to uncover all of them before I finish. Ooh, that's a fun mechanic. That reminds me of Remnant 2. Oh. If you search enough through the game, you can get uh, an explorer class and you have a shovel and you can oh. run really fast and it highlights any interesting objects within yeah. a specific radius i remember you digging with that shovel like everywhere <laughs> yeah that was super weird <laughs> yeah crow country if you like old-fashioned resident evil games i really think you'll like it and i think i got it for 15 dollars, and it, i think it's only 19.99 full price yeah but it was on sale this this last month on playstation network so i got it so um really like crow country so far i hope that it ends with like a fun twist or something the story's like uh, kind of fun as well. There's all these like staff notes you can read as you're exploring around. Really recommend it. It's great. Um, those are the two video games I've been playing this week, Devin. I know you mentioned that you've been playing some Clash because a new season just started, or the Clash has just been making you mad. I'm not sure which. Barely been tapping into that. Yeah, they've got some new, uh, some new evolution cards. Uh, the Musketeer, one of the OG cards that everybody used, the little cannon gun. Right. You remember her? Yeah. She's getting an evolution. Uh, well, she already got it. She now has a sniper for her first three shots. Oh, wow. She can shoot all the way across the arena. Kind of very interesting. And then they're doing an evolution cannon. So just a little cannon on the ground that you set as like a right. tower to uh -huh. attract hog riders, that type of thing. But every time you place this cannon, it rains down missiles across like half of or like a third of the arena. Wow. Really, really weird. Very See, strange mechanics. They're introducing so many evolutions at this point that it's it's kind of cool because it makes the game impossible to fully beat. There's never some meta that beats everything. Right. I was going to say, those new things seem very game-breaking, but I think that's what they want so that the meta is always changing. Yeah, it just... I, it drives some people crazy because it's not OG and everything's not predictable. Yeah. But... I kind of like it because it keeps, keeps it keeps it, it a little fresh. Yeah. yeah. But battle passes, man. Can't keep paying for them. <laughs> so. Yeah, they'll get you. For sure. Other than that, not too much gaming for me. I played a board game today. You did? Yeah. And that'll bring us into our uh, board games of the week. I think uh, I've played two that I want to bring up. And then... For our closing segment, we're going to go over the one that we have here on the table in front of us. So a little tease there, but we'll uh, we'll go over that in our closing segment. So uh, let me see, Devin. I think you threw this tab over to me once. Will you throw it one more time? Oh, there it is. Yeah. Uh, so first up, Devin and I played last week, and I've played it again since. So I've played it quite a few times at this point. I actually... Wait, 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 ah, stop talking, no. me. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, posted my review today of the lord of the rings duel for middle earth which is a really fun two-player game where uh you're trying to win by 
in one of three different ways, either taking different support cards that are green or going up the ring track and getting Frodo and Sam to Mount Doom, or as the bad guy getting the Nazgul to catch Frodo and Sam, or to have complete control over Middle Earth by having one of your troops in all seven locations. Um, sounds like a lot, but it's a really simple game because all you do on your turn is either take a card or claim a landmark tile. Really, really excellent. This game has been uber popular for the last few months. Um, I think it's going to be very popular for quite a while. I imagine they're going to release an expansion or two for it, and I'm all here for that. It needs it, I think, I think just slightly. I think for like the uh, gamers like me that kind of prefer games a little bit heavier than this one, that would be really cool. Especially if the expansion added, like, now the Sauron and the um, Fellowship characters play a bit more differently or feel a lot differently. That would be really cool. But overall, really, really like the game. Um, if you want to see the review score I gave it, uh, make sure to check out this video. That would really help me. Give it a like as well. That would also help me. You know, all kinds of those goodies. So play that again. Really, really enjoy it. And the other one just delivered this week as well. Um, and we're actually going to skip that one, Devin. So oh, okay. go to I'll the, do the uh, other one. third one. And it's in a tiny, tiny box. This is a new version of a game that's been out for a few years. But this is the pocket edition of a trick-taking game called Yokai Septet. And very, very fun game. This one, uh, I think I'm trying to remember the designer's name. Oof, they've got it in Japanese, so never mind. I Oh, no, it's right here. Yio. Or Munayiko Yakauchi. You think I did that right? Yeah, honestly, it's super good. Thank <laughs> cool. you. Cool. Published by Ninja Star Games. Um, I think they have another game on Kickstarter right now, but this is a very popular trick taking game. In this one, there's a lot of sevens, hence the name Yokai Septet. And how it works, let me see if I can find the cards. They've got to be in here. Okay. I want to see the cooler cards from the version I just got. Here they are. Ooh. There are uh, seven different suits in a regular deck of cards that you usually play like hearts and spade, you know, trick taking games with. There's four suits, right? Hearts, diamonds, spades, and clubs. In this game, there's seven suits. They're different colors, red, black, blue, yellow, green, purple, and pink. And each suit has a different range. So one of the suits goes from ace to seven. One goes from two to eight, three to nine. So they slightly shift. But all seven suits have a seven in it. And like I said, lots of sevens in this game. The sevens are important. They're shown right here. The seven sevens and the ace, which are the special cards in the game. And they're the only ways that you can score and win the game. So you're playing trick taking where you must follow like the same suit. If you have a card of that suit in your hand, you're trying to win the sevens. Obviously the seven in the bottom right corner where the, uh, suit only goes from ace to seven is the easiest seven to win because the seven is the highest card of that suit so if i play that seven i will win that trick unless somebody plays it with the trump or trumps it somehow um but some of these other ones like this one the blue one goes from seven to 13 so the seven is the least strong card so that seven's harder to win um a couple little wrinkles the ace there's only one in the green suit the ace wins everything no matter what so it's like the ultimate trump card and you play this game in teams too so i'll get 12 cards my teammate will get 12 cards and then the other two players will also get 12 each so that's 48 cards but seven times seven is 49 so there will be one extra card it gets flipped over and whatever card that is that color or that suit will be the trump suit for this round so if that was blue, then blue would be the Trump suit of the round. Man, I really, really like this trick-taking game. I only have a few trick-taking games. Cat in the Box is one I really, really like. I have another one that I have been really wanting to try called Aurum. And that one is a must-not-follow trick-taking game. If someone leads with a suit, then you're not allowed to play the same suit, which I, I think is going to break my head. I haven't really gotten into trick-taking. Some people, this is like the only genre of game they play. Um, I'm a little late to the trick-taking party, but man, this one's excellent. Really, really love Yokai Septet. I think we played two or three full matches. You get, can you guess how many points you need to win? 
Seven. Yeah, good guess. Yep. If you get seven uh, points, you win. Um, the white stars on the card show how many points the card is worth for you winning that suit. So that green seven again is worth zero points, but um, getting the sevens is how you can win the round. Anyways, really, really excellent trick taking game. If you haven't played Yokai Septet, I don't know if the pocket edition of this is available quite yet. I backed it on Kickstarter, but I know it's going to be on Ninja Star's website um, after they finish fulfilling all of the Kickstarter orders. So I highly recommend that. It's a tiny, tiny box, but it fits sleeved cards, and it's just like 65 cards in a tiny box. It's right up there, Devin, if you want to grab it just for fun, funs and giggles. But uh, yeah, Devin, show them how tiny that bad boy is. Ooh, I don't know if that'll be in the camera. Let me go back to the face cam here for a second. But yeah, super, super cool. Just a tiny little box. That is like quite literally a box that could fit in your pocket. Hence the name Pocket Edition. So there you go. Anyways, those are the two games I played this game. Really enjoyed, or this week, really enjoyed both of those. And we'll save the third game. Oh, nice. Look at that pocket show. <laughs> Uh, it fit in my pocket a little better earlier today, but I'm wearing sweats, so that makes it a little easier than, you know, jeans. Um, and the third game we played together just barely, so we'll cover that at the end of the episode. All right, Devin, for games you're looking forward to this coming week, anything that you're looking forward to playing? Any uh, video games? I wrote down here, the big releases this week are uh, Metal Slug Tactics, for me at least, and uh, Mario & Luigi Brothership. That one got some really good reviews from a couple sites and then some really bad ones from a couple other sites. So I'm really confused on if that one is supposed what to be. What were they saying was bad? I'm not sure. <laughs> I didn't uh. I didn't read them. Just I just looked at the aggregate numbers and stuff. But that one I really like the art style, so I hope that it's one that I will like. I guess um Devin, in other news, you did get a switch. With like uh Yeah, currently borrowing a, a switch games. and most excited to try Tears of the Kingdom. Yeah, it's an excellent game. I, I love it. I think that I will love it, but I also am overwhelmed because those, those games are massive and there's always things to do. Yeah. Um, it is, yeah, it is like that. What I do in those games is I, I don't mainline it exactly because there's like, this one's a bit bigger than Breath of the Wild, but there's like four main dungeons, right? And then a couple other things that are I won't spoil. And they highlight those like on the map pretty early. Like here's like the main things you can do. And I kind of focus that direction. So I don't explore like every nook and cranny of the map because the game really are so big that you could just spend like six months in there just playing around. But even if you, uh, I think I beat it in probably 60 hours. Which hmm. seems like a lot, but uh, for a game of that size, I I probably missed a lot of little secrets and stuff, but man, had a great time. So no matter which way you play it, I think you'll really enjoy it. And other than that, there's uh, Mario Wonder and Metroid Dread and uh, whew, all kinds of other good games. Excited for you to stream some of those. I think that'll be a, I think those will be good. Uh, for me, I'm excited to uh, keep playing Vampire Survivors, finish Crow Country. And I think the, uh, yeah, that's probably the big ones for me. I want to start a ranger, the role puzzling adventure and a uh, wizard with a gun, but I'm going to hold off on starting those just in indie game central, which is uh, something I really enjoy. So I need to get back to UFO 50 as well. So lots of indie games all around for board games. I think I already mentioned this at the top of the episode, um, but arcs is delivering to me tomorrow which i'm very pumped about um, i'm getting the base game and the leaders in lore expansion and the blighted reach big box expansion oh shit. Um, <laughs> yeah let's just take a peek at, at those because they're kind of fun i think i put the blighted reach expansion link in the document but yeah arcs is really really cool just a uh the next newest game from Leader Games, who does Root and Oath and Vast and lots of other four-letter games. Um, this one's really <laughs> cool. It's also a trick-taking game where you are playing cards from your hand. You have to follow the lead suit primarily if you want to have like a powerful turn. Or you can you have a little leeway in this one. You can shift 
to a different suit, but then you only get like one action of that suit. And yeah, the artwork in this one's just so great. I've played it twice on Tabletop Simulator, but it'll be really nice to just have the physical game because I, I do feel like in a trick-taking game, holding those cards in your hand actually is like such a big part of it. And yeah, just really pumped. Oh, I played this on the simulator, didn't I? You did. It's been a while, but you did. And the, uh, whoops, for the uh, expansion, where is this at if I click on it? Uh, Blighted Reach. So this expansion, it takes that base game and kind of cranks up the uh, variability of it by giving you like a completely different set of factions that you play as. And you don't just play one game. You play what they call a micro campaign which will be three different games back to back to back. You don't have to play them all in one sitting. They have like a save system you can put in the box. But um, And then whoever wins at the end of the last third chapter is the overall winner. It also adds like a fourth faction, or not fourth, like a, uh, a non-player character, kind of empire, I think is what it's called. Um, and it changes the game quite drastically, to be honest. And there's like... Quite a, there's like hundreds and hundreds of like unique cards in there. There's not even very many pictures, but I'm super excited for that. It's been, uh, I ordered it back in July and it's finally delivering tomorrow. I've been checking the uh, UPS, I think it's actually FedEx, tracking like every day. I'm like, oops, getting closer. You know the person's name that's delivering it? I don't, but I probably That'd should. That would be concerning. That would be. If I was more social, I'd go out there and meet them when they deliver my dozens of board game packages, but instead, I look out the window, see them, and I hide, like behind the door oh, like, yeah. until they're gone, and mm -hmm. then I, uh, then I grab it. We're all antisocial. Yeah. Um. So that delivers tomorrow, and then I got a note today saying that this game that I also pre-ordered a couple months ago, um, and one other one that we'll get to in a minute, are out of pre-order status. So I could release my hold, and they'll send it to me. So I did that today. So they should be here. My guess is probably won't make it this week, but they'll be here next week. Next one, or this one's Daitoshi, another game by Danny Garcia that we uh, talked about earlier with the... Uh, Love that guy. What game was that? Coming of age game about the teenagers growing up in the oh, arcade yeah, yeah. and stuff. Um, this one is, uh, I think it has this cool round board here. Oh, that's not a great picture. And I think you're moving around kind of this rondelle, but you're also adjacent to this big forest. And I can't even remember the theme so much, but uh, I just like his games so much that I kind of ordered it on blind faith. So maybe that was a dumb idea, but I like the dual layered boards. It looks really cool. It's a heavier Euro game. Um, probably, what did the weight say? I think it's like three and a half, 3.9. <laughs> We're cooking up there, but that doesn't have very many votes yet. Your arc expansion was like 4.4. 4.5 or something. Um, which I don't think is true. Arcs is not that complex, but the expansion does crank it up a little bit. So anyways, I'm excited for a couple of these comp more complex games to show up. And then in that Daitoshi order will also be this one. Pagan Fate of Roanoke. How would you pronounce that? Roanoke. Roanoke. <laughs> um, and this one is a two player only game where one player plays as a witch hunter and the other player plays as the leader of a coven of witches that's trying to protect this uh list of suspects one of which actually is a witch uh, but the other ones are innocent and so the witch hunter is trying to figure out which of these nine cards in the center is the witch and if they can figure that out and like uh take them to trial or something then they win and the other one is trying to hide it from them so there's a bit of like deduction and hiding which is cool. But then it's also like a card play game. So I think that you'll really enjoy this one. Devin really likes the card games um, that have cool combos and stuff. And I think the theme here is really cool too. It has a few expansions as well. And you can get them and then get into like deck building where like before the game starts, I'm like, okay, I'm going to construct my 50 card deck or whatever. And it's going to be different this time than last time. But I just got the base version for now to see if we enjoy it. But Excited to try both of those. That was quite a bit of talking, but hey, I like pulling up pictures from time to time. 
And I don't think I had any of those pictures up on the screen. <laughs> so we're on the wrong scene. You guys just watched us the whole time. <laughs> well, there they are for uh, a second. But uh, anyways, that's <laughs> just going backwards. Here's Pagan, fate of Ron, okay. And uh, if we hit back a few times, then you'll see arcs for a second. I bet that looks hilarious because it's us just staring up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And Daitoshi here with the uh, cool wheel. <laughs> That's so funny. Uh, anyways, so you had to use your imagination a little bit there. Or if you're listening mm-hmm. to us in audio only, then you really had to. And now you thought we were showing them something on the screen that we totally weren't. So joke's on us, I guess. but um, Or on me for not hitting the button on the stream deck. But Those are the games I'm excited about for the coming week. All right, Devin, there's only a few items of news today, and they're uh, all video game related. The first one is definitely the biggest that people have been talking about for the last couple of days. Nintendo had a new internal meeting, which has a very exciting name. Corporate Management Policy Briefing. That's a meeting I want to be in. Yeah, me too. Um, But there were a few important things that they mentioned there. I am going to switch. Okay, we switched to the uh, screen scene and now we're gonna send this uh maybe you already did no i tried i didn't know how <laughs> oh oh it's again because it's a twitter thing huh um i could read you the tweet there you go yeah do something <laughs> i got you i need to delete twitter off of the ipad now too i guess oh this yeah. is furukawa <laughs> <laughs> i think he's nintendo's president At today's corporate management policy briefing, we announced that Nintendo Switch software will also be playable on the successor to Nintendo Switch. Nintendo Switch Online will be available on the successor to Nintendo Switch as well. Further information about the successor to Nintendo Switch, including its compatibility with Nintendo Switch, will be announced at a later date. Nice. That's uh, surprisingly pretty big news because I don't think Nintendo has had a backwards compatible unit for quite a while um they sorry for the train (laughs) honking in the background um they pretty consistently like are reselling wii u games and wii games on the switch currently so some people including myself were a little bit nervous that they were just gonna say yeah they're not it's not backwards compatible they even said in that policy meeting that you're going to be able to buy switch games on the switch to store um so I'm really excited that they're taking this approach where my library is finally going to move forward with Nintendo. And that uh, makes me more likely to buy games digitally because then they'll just be playable on the new thing. So excited about that. Um, they also mentioned they're growing in other markets and they're not changing their timeline on announcing the Switch 2. Probably not going to be anytime soon because if they announced it now, right before the holidays, People wouldn't buy the Switch 1 as much. So probably really late December or early next year, I imagine. So anyways, backwards compatibility for the Switch. Very cool. Um, Next up, Warner Brothers said that Hogwarts Legacy has now sold. Was this also a tweet? No, I sent it over. Oh, you already sent it over. Look at you go. Okay, screen. Uh, Um, Maybe it's not there. Oh, it is there. Look at that. This is uh, Devin's favorite game. He's played it seven times. <laughs> I did enjoy it. I really did. Yeah, it's I good. enjoyed it too. I didn't finish it, but I thought it was well made. I just, uh, I don't know. At that moment when it came out, I was a little bored of open world games, and it was another one mm. at the moment. But it is pretty cool. The combat's like pretty good, even though it, I don't know, it feels weird to just be able to like, say about a cadaver to like a spider and stuff yeah know. if you don't take the unforgivable curses throughout the game and just basically leave them in inventory and not use them mm-hmm. there were some parts of that game that were extremely difficult yeah mm-hmm. um the news about this game though is that uh it has sold 30 million units now which is a monstrous number and warner brothers has said that they are making future games in this series a very high priority and that they will tie into the upcoming HBO series, uh, which is pretty cool. I hope that, Exciting. Yeah. I hope that HBO knocks that out of the park because 
I think they've said they're doing like a season for each book. So they do really? seven seasons. Like that people, would be really cool. People are gonna love that, but they're gonna criticize it so hard. Oh, for sure. Just like <laughs> ring, just like Rings of Power and stuff. So I'm gonna and, love it. Yeah, I, I think I'll probably like it too. I imagine HBO will put like the highest level of quality on it. So yeah, I hope it's great. Anyways, that's the Hogwarts Legacy update. And then the last little one, uh Take Two who publishes uh, a lot of huge games that are biggest being uh, Rockstar's Grand Theft Auto, said that uh, Grand Theft Auto V has now sold over 205 million units, which is wow. a monstrous number. Um, it is 11 years old, so it came out on the PlayStation 3 and then was re-released on the PlayStation 4 and on the PlayStation 5. And they also said that Gran Turismo, not Gran Turismo, Grand Theft Auto <laughs> 6 is still on track for fall 2025. So it doesn't seem like that's going to slip yet, but we'll see. You're telling me the most current GTA started on the PS3? It did, yeah. That's why it plays so bad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's enjoyable. It's the big open world and it's just nonsense. Mm -hmm. And like the really slow movement where they like kind of trudge. <laughs> yeah. yeah, those are supposed to be pretty fun. I've never played one for more than like an hour. And that was just like, how long can you last? before the cops catch you which is kind mm -hmm. of a fun experiment with rocket launchers and helicopters and stuff all right Devin, that's going to bring us to crowdfunding corner for this week this is uh today's november 6th so this crowdfunding corner will go out on november the 8th first up here i guess just a little heads up we usually show games that are somewhat interesting to me i choose them like there's almost an unlimited number so it's hard to include everything. So sorry if I missed something that you're interested in. I'm generally kind of a Euro gamer at heart. So that's kind of where I lean. Um, but this first one is from All Play. And they do a bunch of small games in little boxes. Devin, I have three of them right here. Standing up. Here wow. I have three of them right here. These games are durable. You're going to want to pick them up soon. <laughs> yeah, for real. Uh, I have Chomp, Fiction, and uh, what's that one called? Mountain Goats. Mountain Goats. <laughs> Fell off the mountain. <laughs> yeah, I just about killed Devin with it. Um, they're pretty fun, like smaller games in this cool square-sized box was my point here. Just kind of little games. They do a lot of these. I think they have like 20 or 25 of them in this line at this point. This is for new ones. So you can get them all in this kickstarting Kickstarter campaign separately for $19 each, I believe. Or you can get the four game all in bundle for 76, which is the same price as $19 each. But if you do the four game bundle, you get all of the premium components and any expansions for those four games included for free. So you can see like the uh, expansions for each of those games that either have like premium upgraded poker chips or upgrading the cardboard chips to, uh, I don't know what those are, premium tokens or bonus staff cards or these big meeples for the other two games. So they give you what they say are $58 and extra stuff if you get that four game bundle, which is a little tempting to be honest. But let's look at the four games. They are Ruins. Ruins, I think, has pretty cool kind of art style. Um, I like the weird art. And you're trying to get these different cards, and the game comes with sleeves and these cool transparent cards that you will layer on top of the base card, and you're trying to, uh, I don't know fully, but you're trying to make some cool ruins with that. And the idea is it's a card shedding game. You're trying to get the cards out of your hand before everyone else can but i really like the uh aesthetic and it reminded me when i was reading it of a game i really love called scout which is an excellent card shedding game um, but this one has a little bit more going on with that layering of the transparent cards um, but i don't know i really like the way those transparent cards look it's a cool feature that i feel like uh whenever i see it i'm like ooh, cool but I think I only have one game in my 
collection that actually has uses this and it's not even in the same way it's cloud age where it comes with sleeves that have clouds printed on the sleeves and then you put the cards in the sleeves and you can only see portions of the card through the clouds which is also mm. a cool kind of anti-transparency <laughs> but uh, anyways that one is ruins that's the first game there um it kind of explains here how you play again i love how those look so hopefully the trans i wonder what those are made out of it can't be paper Right? They'd have to be plastic? I assume so. Yeah. Anyways. Um, and you play different sets from your hand. Again, kind of gave me scout vibes when I was reading this. But All right. Ooh, and I just... Yeah, I like the deluxe upgrade here is instead of cardboard pieces, you got wooden pieces, and you got big poker chips. Again, instead of cardboard pieces there. Okay, next one is called Odd Land. It has these quirky, weird-looking animals. And this one is a tile laying game where you are, I say tile, but it's actually cards. The cards have four different biome squares on them, and you'll be overlapping different sections in order to kind of alter the land. And then you can place your weird looking animal meeple on a spot to score points. Like it says this Bagator, which is a weird looking dude, scores two points per space in neighboring water territories or something like that so every animal will score differently so you're playing down a card and then placing down an animal in order to score as much as you can um and the uh upgrade here for these are really cool like wooden versions of the i like the uh where'd it go i just saw a pigeon horse oh yeah pigeon horse oh this um is a moving image that makes sense the gator the pangaroo Owl loose, grizzly. <laughs> so weird. But I kind of like the weirdness, to be honest. Um, tells you how to play here a little bit. And it comes with an expansion with a cheetois. <laughs> it's a tortoise cheetah. <laughs> and a whale elephant. And again, it, the game would come with these cardboard pieces. But if you buy it in the four game bundle and get the deluxe upgrade, it comes with wooden standees for those dudes so and there's a bunch of them it looks like anyways that's a fairly simple game there about kind of a puzzle in the center of the board next up is one called vegas strip this is a game for two to six players plays in about 40 minutes and in this game you're bluffing and you're trying to uh you're putting your own markers in front of these different casinos let's see if i can uh show an image of it right here and you can put up to two of your pieces in front of a casino and you'll have some hidden information like i know that this casino and this casino are corrupt but the rest of them are not corrupt or something like that you won't know all the information but you'll know some so you're trying to bluff and not let your opponents know that you know which one is corrupt the one that you and you score differently based on whether one is corrupt or not. Let me see. How does it uh, say the scoring works again? I feel like it was right here, actually. If it's a corrupt casino, I think when scoring a corrupt casino, the highest bidder wins 10 points and everyone else gets nothing. In a non corrupt casino, whoever has the most points there loses and everyone else gets points equal to their bid. Uh, which are cool contrasting um, ideas there. Um, so that's Vegas Strip. The extra stuff here is the upgraded bet tokens. Um, instead of being cardboard, they are this cool, I don't know if that's plastic or acrylic or what, but those will definitely feel nice, I think. And there are some promo cards for different casino powers. Um, so that's three. The fourth one is a game from The Good Doctor. Reiner Canizia. You got it. Devin's got that name memorized because we talk about him almost every week. <laughs> <laughs> I knew he was going to pop up. Oh, yeah. He's everywhere. Um, this game, I think, is a remake of an earlier game with maybe a couple of changes. And um, in this one, you are trying to get sets of different kinds of money. And I'm trying to remember exactly how you score. You are bidding for cards 
like at the exchange, but then you can use the cards you bid to trade for the bids of other players. Reading how the game works was a little wonky. I think seeing like a round in action would would help for sure. Um, and then you score all the sets you have of different currencies, which just looks like different colors of money, I guess. If you have 200 or more of a currency type, you score the value of that currency. If it's under 200, you score the value of that currency minus 100. Um, so I imagine you could get negative for some if you you know, don't get very many points of a certain uh, color. So anyways, uh, also has a deluxe upgrade with some cool meeples. So anyways, all play, they do good stuff. I think that these four games seem pretty interesting, to be honest. Some of their other ones, um, like, let me show you. They have, oh, this is actually cool. If you get the uh, all four game bundle, it includes this wooden all play token, and it will give you a unique code on the back. And each code is redeemable for one free tiny game in their tiny box line. I don't know which games they have in that line, but um, also very, very $4 shipping in America. Even if you get all four games, pretty crazy. So I don't know. I think it's a pretty good value if you want like quick games, you know, some of them from really famous designers that have a bit more game than the box would uh, make you think. So anyways, that is the four game collection from All Play. And that one ends, I think, if I can scroll to the top because I can't see the scroll bar. There we go. On November 14th, like most of the games that we'll be looking at today do. Okay, next up is one called Grunaville. And this is kind of an economic strategy game where um, you are trying to buy and expand land, then rent the land to make money. And you can like put different buildings as this cool round board. Uh, it's supposed to be a bit heavy and it doesn't have a ton of uh, backers at this point, but it's gotten some pretty good buzz from some uh, people online such as Rado and others. A uh, very unique art style. This is a pretty indie game. I think it's like the third game designed by uh, this guy named Rudy. What was his name? Uh, lost it somewhere. Rudy. Um, and published by his company, Rudy 3. Game is by Rudy Przynski. Um, and there's two different versions. The base version and then a deluxe version that comes with metal coins. Um, like I said, I feel like I'm ultra zoomed in here. So I'm going to try and zoom us back out to 100% if I can. Oh, that's too far. Ah, let's go to 90, actually. I don't mind how that looks when it gets that big button out of my face. Okay. Yeah, in how to play here, it looks like you are expanding. Kind of, you buy different portions of land, and these kind of uh, 90 degree segments of land are added, rows will be added, and then you can rent out the land, plant trees. As a very kind of indie art style as well, you're also like keeping resources, and there's a fluctuating market of how much those resources cost to use. Has a weird looking, what is that? A one, two, three, four sided die. Kind of a weird shape. <laughs> um, and yeah, just a very quirky, unique looking game. So I wanted to give it a shout out. It looked like a, one that could be really cool. I like fluctuating markets um, and you know, kind of economic focused games with markets like that. So Grunaville is on GameFound. And that one is, uh, I think, also on there until the 13th. Yeah, until the 13th of November. Okay, next up is, I thought it was called Mutagen, but in the video they called it Mutagen. So it's one of those two words. And it's a customizable worker placement game set in a biopunk universe. And it's published by Dronda Games, who I really enjoy their games recently. I have a, now what's the train one called? It's called Isle of trains all aboard i thought it was right behind me it's actually right behind devin um they've been making some really killer stuff lately so i'm kind of intrigued by this one as artwork by the micho 
Okay, so yeah, Drondo, I feel like they've been doing really cool stuff lately. Really like the artwork in this strange game. What universe did they call it? Biopunk. You ever heard of Biopunk, Devin? No. Like Bioshock? I don't know. And Steampunk? Steampunk, yeah. Um, this is a worker placement game where you have different workers. And I think one of them's like an engineer and a mechanic. And you'll be sending them to different places on the board. Then you can also mutate those workers in different ways and they'll get like some extra perk. And so they actually have attachable little items that you can place on the workers to show their mutation, which is a you know pretty cool thing. I have a game behind me called Oak that has a, kind of a similar vibe where when you get an upgraded worker, you get to put a different like outfit piece on the meeple. And it is fun to do that. Again, I really like the artwork by the Micho. It looks pretty, uh, I don't know. I don't know if commonplace is the right word, but the uh, worker placement looks, the board, I guess, is maybe my one complaint. It looks pretty basic. Like the, there's one, two, three, four, five, six spots there. I, you can't see my cursor. Um, like here are the six chunks you can set your worker, which I guess in worker placement games, that's not too uncommon but i didn't like the way the board looked for some reason but i do think the artwork's really cool i think it looks fun um even if worker placement seems like it's uh maybe used too much in games nowadays i like the mechanism so i don't know i guess i'm complaining about nothing <laughs> but um yeah it has a solo mode and in, in the deluxe version you get those little hand pieces that will uh made from soft PVC that will attach onto the meeples. They also have in that deluxe version, two expansions from David Turksey and Johnny Pack um, that are just like two mini expansions you can add as well. So anyways, I think the game looks cool. That is Mutagen from Drawn to Games. And it is also on Kickstarter until the 14th, I believe. No, sorry, the 13th. Okay, next up is a party game. This one is called Half-Truth Second Guess. This one was designed by Ken Jennings, the Jeopardy guy, who I think hosts Jeopardy oh, yeah. now, um, and won like a bunch in a row. And Richard Garfield, who I think designed like Magic the Gathering. So like two pretty sharp dudes. I have the first game, Half-Truth, which is a fun party game. Devin, you've played it with me a mm -hmm. couple times. In this sequel, <clears throat> it's fairly similar just comes with a bunch of new cards, a similar board. The main difference here is in your team, each player gets to decide if they're going to submit like one, two, or three answers instead of the whole team together as a team. And so if I am end up being correct, I contribute to my team score, even if my teammate, you know, doubled down and was wrong, which I think is cool that each team member will be able to... Is it uh, like that golf game where you take the best shot? Oh, yeah, there you go. Best ball. Best ball. Best ball. Uh, Half-truth. Half-truth. Best ball. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what they're going for here, I guess. Um, but yeah, really great party game. I've enjoyed it a lot. My family, I think, has liked it. It's a trivia game where you don't have to be good at trivia because they're tough questions. Like, one of the questions on the back of the box in the first game is like, Movies over three hours long, and I give lists six movies like Dances with Wolves and five others, and three of them will always be true and three will always be false. But all six of those movies were within like five minutes in length of each other, and mm -hmm. I was like, I don't know, Godfather two or Dances with Wolves. Uh, so there's sometimes are things that you, it's hard to know. So the point there is that the person that knows the most about trivia isn't always going to win in this game. It's about when do I make a safe bet. And when do I double down? So half truth is really great. I'm I've been thinking about this one. I think it's uh cool. I already have the original, but I like the idea of the different teammates being able to contribute in that way. So we'll see. I'm guessing that one will also come to retail. Hopefully, it has quite a few backers. Twelve hundred. That one is also there until the thirteenth of November. Okay. Next up is a cooperative game. I'm not a huge fan of cooperative games at times, but this one I thought had a unique piece on the board, so I wanted to give it a shout out. <clears throat> Even though the gameplay seemed uh, 
I don't know, somewhat comparable to other cooperative games where there are like these disaster cards that come out and you have to put enough like uh, pieces on the disaster card to get rid of it before it puts like pollution and bad stuff in the air. The way that you win in this game is by um, putting enough sustainability tokens on the one side of the board so that it is always flipped this way. And if you fill that side, then your team wins. If there's ever enough pollution on the other side that the board tips, you immediately lose. Mm. So you can never tip to the other side or you lose. So you got to manage the pollution and then you have to fill the other side to win. Cool idea there. It's very much a gimmick, <laughs> but it looks cool to see it like tipping. Um, and, you know, tipping point being in the name is kind of fun. It has a lot of cards, some unique like player boards, but it's mostly, you know, playing cards in order to stop the disaster cards so that we don't get more pollution. I think on this page they mentioned that this game was designed like in some sort of a collaboration but yeah right here earth 2053 tipping point was created in cooperation with uve rosenberg the designer of games like agricola bonanza patchwork which i have in ottawa and a feast for odin which i also have he's one of the kings of board games for sure uve rosenberg he's like the farming designer where like you always have to feed your workers or else they die and stuff but anyways a big name to have thrown around on their uh their page here so anyways i thought it looked kind of fun if you like cooperative games that seems like a, a fun mechanism there with that uh tippy board seesaw with 50 wooden discs wonderful and a bunch of cards in there as well that one also ends on that one's the 14th 13th and 14th lots of games ending on those days okay Devin. this game is called tend from ivy studios you've actually played one of their games before called fractured sky um, they make kind of big pretty games with kind of fancy pieces um, and this one is no exception it's a uh, very cool it's a sci-fi farming game where it's kind of a roll and write you are doing a bunch of stuff on a board in order to plant crops and go fishing and whoever has the most like the most successful farmstead in this sci-fi world will win. But it has some kind of weird quirks to the game. So let me uh, show you kind of the uh, parts here. So a new kind of flip and write. You have these cool dice and you have to kind of plow the ground underneath them. And then the die sits there and then from turn to turn, it will kind of rotate to the next side to show it like growing. And then eventually it gets to a side that has a white number and that means it can be harvested which is cool um but it also is like they say here it's technically a flip and scratch and roll and tick and stamp and write but that's too long to put on the box they said um in the, this game when you uh till the crops you're going to draw these little squigglies you put these cool crop dice on there and then the game comes with scratch off cards when you go explore the woods, you use this metal coin to scratch off sections and you don't know what's under there. It's printed like in kind of a random fashion. Um, so when you're mining, you're doing that, which is very cool. They said um, during this campaign, they included an extra 50 scratch off cards. So it comes with 100, you get 150 during the campaign. And they have a mobile app or it might be a web app uh, where you can... Uh, like pull it up on your phone and play an unlimited number of times because that was my concern it's like oh what if i run out of scratch cards mm -hmm. um, so kind of cool that they thought of that very cool idea you also uh, have these fish fishing uh little sections where you're trying to uh, roll dice on like a uh, column and row basis to get catch the fish you want um and you're marking stuff all over this board and then the other side of the markers is a uh, stamp. And you're putting mm. these different goods in your shipping manifest. And they could be fish or plants or other things. And so you're filling that up in kind of this puzzle mode as well. So there's a lot going on here. Kind of premium 
component versions here include the fancy markers that have the marker on one side, the stamp on the other side, the scratch and sniff, <laughs> sniff, not snip. <laughs> the scratch uh, cards are included in every version, I believe. Um, and yeah, it has a, a neoprene play mat in some of the versions, a bunch of different markers, tons of different, I think each player gets two sheets, a project sheet and a farm sheet. And then you also get a scratch off card for the mines and fishing cards. Um, a metal coin for scratching, the cool fishing dice. So it's very like a pretty game with lots of big components. And then as part of this campaign, yeah, there's an extra 50 or 100, depending on the tier you do, sheets. So very cool idea. My neighbor is backing this one. Um, so I probably won't, and I'll probably just play his copy. <laughs> mm. uh, their games are kind of expensive. If you want the version that comes with the markers, which is the middle version, not the one with like the play mats and the extra version um that is a hundred dollars so it's a and they have a hundred and thirty dollar version with the super deluxe stuff and a seventy dollar version but that one doesn't come with the uh markers so i don't know kind of unique yeah for sure they do unique stuff over there that is tend that one is on kickstarter until the 14th as well. Nope, the 15th. Holy cow. Just going one day at a time. Yeah. And I think we only have one more. Is that right, Devin? Correct. Okay. Last one here is Robotopia, <clears throat> a strategic Euro game of robot revolutionaries. This is a worker placement game. Kind of has a cool robot vibe to it. I like the way it looks. In this game, you have three different levels of workers, one, two, and three. And the level one workers you place right on a spot. The level two workers you place on the line between two spots, and you get to activate both spots. And the level three workers go at an intersection between three spots, and you get to activate all three, which is pretty cool. Um, other than that, it has kind of a cute aesthetic. It looks like it would maybe be a kid's game, but it says like 70 to 120 minutes, and I think like 12 plus at the top. So even though they went with a more cartoony and child-friendly uh, aesthetic. I, I don't think it's uh, meant for kids. I think it's a, a Euro game through and through. So as a standard edition with meeples, but I really think if you want this game, you probably want at least the middle edition because it comes with those uh, screen printed custom robot shapes. And I, I think those just help remembering too. This one has one base. This one has two bases and that one has three, right? It looks like this guy, he could kind of do like, all three. If you ran out of a one or a two, you could use them for... Yeah, maybe that's what he's for. I'm not sure. But, but then if you're playing with this one, that just looks like that would be terrible. Because I have to remember, like, what color has one foot and what color has two feet? So that's, that's an example of, like, a component upgrade that I think helps not just it look better, but also it probably plays simpler. And then they have a super deluxe version with the play mats and stuff, but... Uh, cool vibe there, I think, and the idea of the different uh, workers that go out in different ways is also cool. So, again, worker placement used a lot nowadays. All right, Devin, that's it for our games this week. What is going to be uh, Devin's pick of the week out of these, how many was that? Eight different games that we looked at mm. for the week of November 8th. It's a tough one for me because I think you're leaning towards Tend. I'm undecided at this point. You choose whatever one you want, because I've got a couple. And the and the pack of four games from all play. Mm -hmm. That's fun. There's so much variety there. Mm -hmm. And then Robotopia just looked funny at the end. Yeah. Um. <laughs> so I'm choosing half the list. <laughs> um, any one of those stand out more than the others? Ten. Ten. I think. Okay. Yeah, I like it. That one, I think, does look really cool. The uh, I watched like a little mini playthrough, and there is a lot going on because you have two full sheets um, of stuff that you're marking, and then you're putting out those like crop dice. Um, and you can also, instead of doing crops, you can put fences in that area to put animals out instead. Um, and then you can go mining and 
So it seems like there's quite a few different options and strategies you could employ. You could say, well, I'm just going to fish this game. And then if you upgrade some other stuff, you can fish out further. So you get like this card that sits above your board. That's like a different fishing pond. And I don't know. It's kind of crazy. So I think that's a, uh, a good choice, Devin. For me this week, I'm going to pick the uh, four games from all play. I think the uh, value there is really cool. And I really like the way that a couple of those games sound. Ruins with the transparent cards looks really cool. And Vegas Strip with the kind of bluffing mechanism I think seems really awesome. So that's one that I've got my eye on with the four different games there. Ruins, Oddland, Vegas Strip, and Money. And that's going to do it for Crowdfunding Corner for the week of November 28th. All right, Devin. We're going to hop off of the screen here, back to just our faces. I don't know if I uh, did that screen very well. There was a lot of clicking and loading and ad blocking going on. <laughs> but hey, we're back. To end our show today, Devin, with an exclusive look at a game we just played today. And we still haven't told you what it is, so we're finally going to go down to the table. Wabam, and there we are, I think. Yep, we played Ooh. this new game called, um, <clears throat> excuse me, called Ironwood. This game is from Mind Clash Games, and it's a two-player game where one player plays as the Ironclad, and that's what I played today. And the other player plays as the Woodwalkers, and that was Devin today. Cool aspects to the game. I'll just quickly tell everybody how it plays, and then we can talk about what we liked or didn't like about it. Um, you play on this board. The iron clad faction is already here. They have established a forge in the center area and they have control with three of their dudes or warriors on each of the three inner mountains. And then the woodwalkers start in the outside like this. Um, and the iron clad will be moving their mine around to mine a bunch of these blue crystals. And then they have to drop it back off at a forge, which could be back at home base or one of these later on and if you do that then you get the crystals and can use them you're playing cards out and every both players have three turns per round with a, a card each the woodwalkers are trying to attack the drill to steal the uh, crystals and not let the ironclad get too many because if they get five they can turn one of their foundations like this one here into a forge and if they get three of their octagon shaped forges out they win the woodwalkers if they get three of their octagon shaped totems they win they have to uh, discover where they are they're somewhere in the land at one of the 10 mountain sites and they're kind of randomized by this uh, vision deck here so Devin has to like Find those cards, keep them secret from me if he can. There are a few ways that I could look at some of his cards too to know like where he might or might not be focused on. Then he has to move his dudes around. Maybe it was here at Oria. And once he gets next to it, he can use a card to discover a totem. And then he has to secure that totem by quickly, as fast as he can, moving it out to the outer forest securing that token before I kind of try to fight him and stop him from leaving with it. And if he gets three of those, then he wins because he was able to call this guardian of the forest character here to uh, wipe the ironclad off the land. And if I build three forges, I've fully taken over the land and uh, my foothold is too great to be stopped. So um... <laughs> you didn't like that? It was nice. <laughs> Uh, it's a really cool and very pretty two-player only game. I really like the touch of having only metal pieces for the ironclad. I mean, these pieces are awesome. And only wooden pieces for the woodwalkers. It makes them seem like, you know, that tale as old as time. You got Fern Gully or something here mm -hmm. with the forest people and the, uh, the machines cutting down the forest. Um, this is a, a bit more serious than that. And it's actually... Playing the game isn't very difficult. You usually just play a card and do something on your turn. But assessing the board state and like which card should I play because I need to move dudes in. And then if I do that, am I going to be able to fight? And then 
force him to retreat. And if I do fight, then I play another card for its effects over here. And is that going to be enough strength to knock him out? And then can I move this totem before the totem fades on the next turn? And can I stop him from building forge from this foundation? If I'm able to like knock all of the ironclad's dudes out, he doesn't have control of the mountain anymore and then can't build the foundation. So surprisingly, even though it's pretty easy to play, you play three cards per round and then kind of do a little reset where you get a couple gems at the start of each round and stuff like that. There's a lot going on on the board that complicates it quite a bit. Um, I agree. Mm -hmm. I like that. It kind of... Some people online have been saying this feels like two-player root. And I can see that a little bit with like the, the clearings and like the forest between the clearings. And there is a lot of fighting. For sure. And I almost mentioned the root thing because we have different win conditions because the mechanics yeah. for each player are different. And I think that's what makes the game maybe have some longevity. Yeah. You could play it multiple times as different factions. Well, just between the two. Yeah. Um, but as a first time play, it was interesting because I didn't really understand his mechanics for the ironclad. Mm -hmm. And so when he was moving, I wasn't 100 percent sure what he was going for. And I got caught off guard a few times and he let me go back on my turns and change some things. Um, but yeah. I, I like the big decks. There's a lot of cards in these decks which give you a big yeah. variety. There's not a ton of duplicates either. No, there's some cards that are in there twice. But yes. A lot of them are just singles. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so when it's coming down to it, you're like, oh, no, I think I'm going to lose this game. But wait, I just got this card that's a passive effect for multiple rounds or... I got a card where I can instantly take some of his troops off the field and I get a pick from where. And so it was cool. It's super, super well balanced. I thought you were going to destroy me. I really did. When you started getting passive effects and whatnot, I was like, I did not play this right. But it ended up coming pretty close. Yeah, no, it really did. I, I think I, I had two forges pretty fast, but then you caught up and got two totems, like almost back to back. Um. Yeah, I agree with everything you said. I think it's uh I think it's really solid. I like the way it looks visually. Mm -hmm. I did play it uh solo once last week before we played today. And solo I feel like is a little trickier. You have more to manage. I played as the ironclad against the wooden bot, and the other side of these boards has like the bot rules on it. And then there's also this uh let's see if I can grab mm -hmm. it without knocking everything down like I did a minute ago. <laughs> Um, this pretty big pamphlet that goes over. Okay, this is the wooden bots rules right now. But then at certain points, there's going to be a totem on the board. And so they bloop, become in, exalted. And now their rules change. So you've got basically a double sided pamphlet just for playing against them. Then when you're playing the wooden warriors and playing against the ironclad, you use the inside here and it talks about their actions there. So I thought playing against the wooden bot. The uh, administering the solo bot was a bit cumbersome. So I don't know, maybe that gets better with more plays. But I would imagine if this has a tabletop simulator, playing one player would be much more enjoyable because it would do some of that monotonous yeah, if reading. Exactly. If someone's made a scripted mod that would do the logic for you, that would be really fun because then you're just focused on yourself. I was making my moves pretty fast, but then I was confused on how to make the other dude's moves that I didn't want to care about. So it's better in two players. I like at least I've only played it twice so far, once solo and once at two players. Liked it a lot better at two players because then I'm reacting to an actual human instead of like a decision tree. And that decision tree was a little confusing. Um, yeah, I really, really like it. I think the cards are cool and... Some of them, like Devin mentioned, can be very helpful in certain situations. There was a point over here when Devin like had a few dudes on, I think there was even a totem there or there was about to be or something. And I got a card that let me put a white marker on his dudes and that just wouldn't let them move for the rest of the round, mm -hmm. <laughs> which was kind of crazy. And then I think Devin did the same thing to me on one of the mountains. Um, I've only played as the Ironclad and I really like playing as them. Because uh, I feel like they're kind of the bad guys oppressive force in this game where you're like drilling around with the drill, getting crystals, and 
it seemed like it was easier for me to get cards. At least earlier in the game, I had a lot more cards than you did. You had a lot more troops than I did. And too. I had a lot more troops. I feel like it's easier for them to get troops out. Because every time the drill moves for the second time, you get to leave a troop in the spot you just left. And it's so just a new one. It's just a new troop. That's crazy. Uh, so that that helps a lot to leave troops behind. Um, and I feel like they move around easier because you're going to move them as a grouping. Mm-hmm. Right? This is one movement to move these four dudes to Aria. Or that would have been four moves for the other faction. So I f- I'm not sure. I feel like most of the forums I've read online have said that the wooded walker seems overpowered. But oh. from the two plays that I've done, I thought the ironclad seemed overpowered. So now I don't know what's going on. <laughs> yeah, I think a couple more plays might tell you. Because mm-hmm. I didn't have a strategy the first 50% of that game and really wasn't going toward much yeah. except fighting. Mm-hmm. And I think if I went for my objective quicker, maybe I could have won. Maybe. <laughs> it was tight. Yeah, there at the end, you were a I mean, you were a turn away from winning if I hadn't won, because I think right? I think you were a turn or two. You needed to discover yeah, maybe another a round totem. or two away. So maybe yeah. three to five full turns. Yeah. But if you had been able to stop me one more time, like wiping my dudes out or then, taking your crystals. Yeah. Then that would have slowed me down enough where you had time mm-hmm. to do those three turns or whatever. Yeah. All things considered, it was close. The mm-hmm. game is the game is well balanced. Yeah, it seems like it. I uh, again, I feel like the woodwalker, at least for my brain at this point, seems harder to plan or play as. I don't know, though. Maybe not. Yeah. All the woodwalkers start on the edge of the map and they're unusable <clears throat> on the edge of the map. So right, you, you must move them all have to move in. inward before they have any function. Mm-hmm. And that's a strange mechanic. Yeah, it is hard to get inside. I wonder if like people move more around the outside before they go in. If yeah, that's maybe. like a smart play. I don't know. Um, I do like the golems as like the big warriors for the... But they're hard to get out. Like this card that let me put out a golem, you have to remove a regular dude in order to put him out or there was another one that cost a couple crystals i think to put out some i really like the art <clears throat> on the cards is really cool the board art i really like too it reminds me of princess mononoke <laughs> for mm. some reason i get that vibe from the forest spots um and even from like the little towns here it just reminds me of that movie for some reason but then i look at a card and i'm like oh it's not like that really at all but I like the way it looks. It's a very pretty and cool game. Um, yeah, I don't know. Any other thoughts about it after a single play, Devin? I think we've covered probably most of the. Yeah, we've covered most things. I <clears throat> I do like how the order of operations is just there on your board is really right handy. on your board. Yeah, you can't really mess that up, which is nice. Yeah, I, it looked confusing to me at first, mm-hmm. but truly after taking two turns, I fully understood the processes until something new came up and then. It was easily learned as well. Yeah, I agree. I think the the rule book is surprisingly long. Um, and so when I started reading it, I was like, man, is this game going to be more complex than I want it to be? But because this is printed here and like you can keep track of everything really nicely, like my first turn's done, my second turn's done, my third turn's done, because you put the cards right there in this little slot. And these white markers work really well for the cards with the ongoing abilities. Yeah, I think it works really well. Um, so yeah, I don't know that I have much more to say about it. At this point, I, I really like it. I just need to play some more. I want to try the Woodwalker because I... Uh, yeah, I just I feel like I would stink at using them. <laughs> Try Like, thinking about the moves I was making, like throwing troops around. Like, I threw five or six troops here on the last turn trying to, like, secure this last spot. I'm like, how do you keep up with that? as the other faction when you can't move that quickly you had some cards that let you move like five dudes but five dudes for you is like i don't know if there were five here it's like okay well i can move one and you can't ever move a guy more than once in a turn so yeah. he's done and then two three four five. i don't know 
And in order to do a second action on that move, I had to spend gems. Mm -hmm. Spend two gems to then attack after barely moving those five. And the Woodwalkers only get one gem per turn. Whereas yeah. the Ironclad get two. So I don't know. It's a it's very unique. I like it a lot. I, I like that it seems easier to play than I thought it would. After reading the rulebook. And especially after that solo play, I was like, oh no. <laughs> um, is this going to be rough? But it's really not when you're playing with another human. So anyways, really like it so far. Um, let me know your thoughts in the comments if you have enjoyed this game, it's one that I want to, uh, yeah, I think I want to keep it for a while, play it some more and see if it's one that will make its, uh, I don't know, get its place on my top two player games or not. So anyways, that's going to do it here, Devin, for this uh, kind of early thoughts on Ironwood and for episode 32 of the podcast. We did it. It's uh, <laughs> We've been recording stuff for four hours. How are you feeling? I did not know it was that late. I didn't either. At all. Yeah. <laughs> um, I shouldn't have uh, had that uh, energy drink I had before we started because I, I feel like I'm ready to go. He's ready for four episodes of Impractical yeah. Jokers. There you go. I do like or the joke. more responsible thing and doing playthroughs of games. <laughs> yeah, I do. I do enjoy playthroughs of games as well. Um. All right. Well, thanks so much for listening, watching. Make sure to check out the rest of the content we do on Super Game Brothers and gaming top down. Uh, check us out on patreon.com slash Super Game Brothers if you want to write into the show, get early access to the shows, all kinds of uh, good stuff. And we will see you next week for episode 33. What's 33? Uh, what's my age? Oh, what's my age again? There you go. Cool. All right. Till then. See you later. Thank you.